Among a terrifying list of achievements, Sarah was the first female professor in geotechnical engineering in Europe and only the ninth female professor at ETH when she joined in the 1990s, a fact that shocks me every time I hear it. Equally as terrifying on a personal level, my first boss in Switzerland, when after meeting at a conference in London in 2007, I emailed to ask her for a postdoc and to my eternal surprise, she said yes. When I told my colleagues back in London that I would be working for Sarah, they looked at me in horror and said, but Linda, you're not fit enough for that. I was a little confused, but soon understood why they had said that to me when I began running in my lunch breaks and had to start inventing ever more elaborate reasons why I couldn't go out and train with Sarah, who has represented the UK at four sports at an international level, and PhD student Emma, who happened to be an Olympic cyclist. I think it's fair to say that my perception of fitness is not in the same league. In my four years working with Sarah, I heard it said to me multiple times, oh, it must be amazing working for such an inspiring woman. Working with Sarah was inspiring, among other things that I won't go into at this point, but this language continually irked me as I couldn't help but wonder what adjective would have been used if Sarah had been a man. It was with this background in mind that I wanted to ask Sarah to chair our panel today, as I think I wanted to hear it for myself from the inspirational person about what it's like to be put on this strange pedestal. So with that, I would like to hand over to Sarah and to begin with a question. We've been focusing in this series about the effect of lockdown on women. How did the Shaw Lighting for ETH come up with your pandemic response? How much was the effect of gender on your workers considered as you created this response? And did you get it right? Sarah. Oh, well, that's about three questions, isn't it? So, um, so I think, I think it comes down to individual leadership style and everybody in the shoe lighting work very much as a team to try and identify what the problems were and then to try and solve them. So my leadership style is very consensual. And I think having identified way back in January, we were going to have a problem with our students returning from China of both genders, um, then it all trickled through from there. So we established uh, some scenarios. We kept on making them richer and richer by sucking in information from students, assistants, directors of studies, heads of departments, um, the conference, CARDL, all of, all of the groups, um, until we came up with um, two scenarios from my side, which I then presented to the Schuleitung and made a recommendation of what we were going to do. And the feedback I received, at least from a lot of our professors who then sent it off to their old universities in Germany, who came, oh God, ETH has really got it right. I don't know whether we got it right, but we shared it across the whole of Switzerland. We had some really good ideas. And, um, and the, particularly the, the key one, I think, was that exam, if you failed in the exams in the summer, that wouldn't count. So that reduced the stress on the students and made the real important point please do not stop, um, do not stop learning. So um, how much was that aimed at the woman? It was aimed at everybody. Um, but of course, I think um, the two gender groups take something, they have, there's, a, there's a sort of a tendency in the way women tend to act and there's a tendency in the way, but there are lots of crossovers as well. And, and we have to look at it from the perspective of everybody and make sure that no one is going to be shut out. So it also meant that I spent time going and listening to the women's groups, to the LGBTIA plus groups, to the international groups as well, to do some soundings to say, how are you, are you managing, you know, can we, can we help? So, um, so yes, there was a gendered, there are gendered aspects to it, um, but I, I'm the rector of the whole of ETH, um, but I do spend a little bit more time worrying about the women um, quite often. I don't know if I answered all of the questions within your, 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 your thing, but that was an answer anyway. That was perfect. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, then I hand over the panel to you. Thank you very much. So I believe we're now going through um, everybody else's. Uh, Caitlin, are you going to read out the names? Have you got an order for everybody to say something or am I just going to hand over to different people and say, can they give their 30 seconds? I'm just going to put everyone on spotlight here and you can just go um, go around in what looks like okay. a circle to you. Right, Nora, I've never seen this spotlight thing before, but Nora, you're on the spotlight. Go, please. Great. Um, hello. I'm a project manager at the Center, uh, Competence Center for Diversity and Inclusion at the University of St. Gallen. 
my motivation to participate was that um, we work with a lot of companies directly to um, improve diversity and inclusion, including a lot of clients from the AEC industries. And I've one of the really big aspects of my work this year has been to explore how this new normal is affecting women and men differently among my clients. And from an academic perspective, I did my PhD research on how organizations cope with extreme change or sudden crises. Um, although those were very different contexts, this, this was about rebel groups in civil wars, but um, in a way, some of the concepts still apply. So um, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Hello. Hello. Are we back now? Hello. Alexandra, how about you have a go? I'm just going to plug in my uh, my connection. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yes, Alexandra Klotz, I'm professor of new work at the Ost Ostschweizer Fachhochschule. Um, and we, are we do studies about new work, how we will work in, in future. And for us, the new ways of working um, allow a better gender equality in organizations. Um, but uh, I guess organizations don't see it really. So we have to find um, tools of implementation, how we can really find a good way um, to, to improve the gender equality in organizations. So this is my motivation also to be here to, to discuss a little bit more the results of our studies. And um, yes, uh, thank you for, for having me here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra Christina. Yes, um, I'm Christina Seiler. I'm a board member of the Swiss Association of uh, Female Engineers. And I have a project of reconciliation of career and family for STEM women. And um, my motivation for participating is when I was in lockdown during spring, I suddenly found myself in a situation that I thought belonged uh, in the 1950s. So from one day to the next, my husband was responsible for earning the living while I was looking after the children and doing the household. And when I spoke with other women in my surrounding, I realized that many of them had made the same experience. So the question that concerns me since then is how on earth could this happen in the year 2020 and what can we do about it? Thank you very much, Christina. Good air, Vita. Yeah, that's actually a very good link. Um, first of all, Gula Grota, I'm Professor of Work and Organization Psychology at the ETH Zurich. Uh, I got involved in this because we did a survey during the lockdown in at, with all of ETH employees. And I guess the one finding that I also presented earlier, which links I think directly to what Christina was saying was that we were astonished when we were asking women and men thinking there would be some sort of new normal uh, at the beginning of June, which then never really happened. But anyway, asking them how many days would they want to work from home once this was free to choose again. And uh, I think the most frequent value across everyone was two days, but for women, a close second was actually one day. Um, and our interpretation of that was kind of exactly what, what was just said that, I mean, women probably often made the, had the experience then that yes, once they're back at home, then they do all this stuff again that normally they're separated from by being at a different place when they're at work. And interestingly, I, we, we had this leadership for faculty event on Monday um, 
And one of the professors afterwards told me that he went back to his wife and asked her, is that actually true? And then they started fighting over this. <laughs> and so I think there is something to that. So I think overall, I think we've discussed home office and all of that a lot in the context of how this would be so wonderful for women. And I think we've had the experience now that yes, sometimes, but definitely not in this kind of way. It's currently happening in lots of families and the flexibility working from home maybe should be pushed much more for men than for women um, looking at the current situation. Thank you, Gudella. Very insightful. Patricia, would you like to complete the row, as it were? Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Sarah. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm a program director for diversity and management programs at the University of St. Gallen. And my motivation to be here, certainly also after my input about the different effects of the pandemic on men and women, um, are a bit threefold. Um, the first one is because I think inequalities are coming more to the surface and are more pronounced in this crisis. Um, and not only gender inequalities, really, all sorts of inequalities. And then the second aspect is really that I think our leaders are in high demand now in these uncertain times and that they should really kind of take topics like diversity and inclusion more seriously. Um, and the third aspect really is that I, I do not only see um, it very pessimistic, but I think this crisis offers a rare and also short chance to reflect and create also a future with hopefully more equality. Fantastic, Patricia. Um, thank you very much to everybody for setting the scene. Caitlin, are we going to do the poll now? Hand over yes. to you, please. Exactly. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for introducing yourselves. I'm just going to launch now a poll. We would like to um, ask the audience um, their motivation for joining this panel discussion. So if you could quickly take a minute. That's quite difficult. You could have almost ticked everything there. <laughs> That's a fact. Good. Let's give it another 15 seconds. Wonderful. So while we're waiting for that to, um, to come through, and uh, Caitlin, you'll tell us the results because this will mm -hmm. be important in steering what we do with the questions later. I just want to share with everybody, I've asked the panelists um, what, just to again, pick up on something Patricia said about the, um, the, the, the sort of the optimistic side as well. We know there's all sorts of challenges. We know it's been absolutely catastrophic in many countries in many areas. However, individually, there's been some best bits about it. And I'd like to hear in a nutshell from each of the panelists, what has been the best what has been the most challenging? A couple of sentences on each. Um, and what is your lesson for the future? Again, in a nutshell. Um, but after we've heard the results of the, of the poll, I think. Good, I'm going to close it now. Uh, Best most challenging and lesson for the future. There we go. Yeah. Okay, new work culture. That's very interesting. Okay. Good. So how women might benefit, what, we, what leaders can do, what individuals can do, and what the impact could be. Okay. So this is really, really very nice. This is a very positive um, outcome, I, I would say. What's the new work culture, the benefiting from the new work culture is absolutely the most important thing, but also the impact um, of a new work culture. So that's all nicely linked as well. And then what can leaders and what can individuals do for positive change? So I really like that as a, um, as a really positive um, statement. So on that note, um, can I start again with you, Nora, please, on my three questions, best, most challenging, and the lesson. Thank you. So in terms of work, I think the best has been that I have 
started working more with team members that I maybe didn't work with before, just because it's so easy to just give someone a quick team call or um, ask someone for help in this really more informal way that before in person, maybe I wouldn't have because I wouldn't have seen them. Um, I think the most challenging is related to that is feeling like you always know what the people you're working with on a team, what are they up to, what are they doing? Um, is everyone on the same page? Are the expectations clear? So both for people that I work with or work for, but also with people that I supervise, especially, I think it's been a really, really real learning curve to learn how to make that, those things really clear. So I think that's my main lesson is to really start almost over communicating expectations and goals and give feedback or ask for feedback much more frequently. Thank you very much, Nora. Um, Alexandra. You're muted at the moment, Alexandra. We're missing your words of wisdom. Still muted? So, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, while we had the lockdown, I was in maternity, so I don't have really a personal experience. But uh, what I saw was a little bit, there's more flexibility now when we work. So it's a really positive uh, thing uh, that um, also in our family, I've may, I really saw a change. We are more flexible in organizing all the family stuff. And yes, my daughter is sometimes in the camera, so I'm sorry. <laughs> and um, but I saw also the communication is a really big point. Oh, um, we are really now concentrate to have all in real time, in perfect time. So we have one meeting after a meeting. We don't have any breaks. And we are really, the whole time, I guess, we are only in meetings. And uh, even when we have a coffee break, we are in meetings to talk each other. We don't see us. Uh, when we are going to a meeting, <laughs> uh, we don't have any informal com communication. And um, this is a really big issue. And when I uh, really talk to my colleagues, they all have big problems with this type of change that um, a communication with, that we have a communication problem a little bit. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Christina. Yes, uh, for me, the best and the worst thing is the same. It was to realize uh, how much we still have to invest in gender equality. And uh, the challenge is uh, how do we achieve this when we get back to, um, uh, to normal life in brackets, uh, when everything else becomes uh, more important and uh, when we talk about uh, why do we have to deal with gender equality, don't we have any real or, or um, deeper problems right now? Thank you very much, um, Christina. Then, uh, Gudela, bitte. Uh, okay, I think the best was, I mean, the ease with which you can join super interesting meetings all over the world which I guess is also the challenge because, I mean, you could just spend, I mean, all your days, 24 hours in, in incredible webinars and whatever, uh, and to make the selection there. I think the future to me is really very much around keeping the flexibility. I mean, I keep saying to me, the future would be two to three days of working from home and 50% reduced travel, which I think would be good in all sorts of different ways. Thank you very much, Rudella. And Patricia, would you like to close out this round? Yeah, thank you. Um, I would almost look at it from two different um, angles, from a pers personal perspective and a professional one. Like from a personal perspective, the best was definitely to be around my kids more. Um, I have two teenagers and I think I would have never spent that much time with my two teenagers than in the lockdown and ever since in March. So I enjoyed it a lot. But on the on the negative side, I think I have to learn to set my boundaries. And that's also a, a huge learning because I'm working more than ever um, because, you know, it just 
constantly around the laptop and uh, um, yeah it's just almost like uh, um, the, the whole day so I think I have to learn that uh, a little bit better and in terms of my uh, team and the professional work um, I would say we had all a very steep learning curve um, and we really stood together and joined forces and achieved a lot this year that's amazing but at the same time I also feel the whole remote work um, leads to the fact that we have to make sure that everyone feels belonged to the to the team like this sense of um not just being included but really feel that uh, they um have also a certain uh, part of psychological safety when it comes to um speaking up maybe about challenges um, at home but also in the workplace and uh, so i also learned from that that i have to create enough room and time for the team members to address that Okay, thank you very much indeed. So there's some really interesting, so opening questions. And I think what are, what really particularly interests all of us and certainly our, our, our um, attendees um, is in terms of what will the new normal in architecture, engineering and um, construction look like when we come back together, which I, I imagine will be sometime in the middle of next year. Um, um, once the vaccines are really broadly accessible and up and running. And, and just a comment on the construction industry. What I've seen certainly as a board member of ETH is that we have been building, we've been building, it almost seems manically, although I'm sure it isn't, it's very systematic. And there have been less delays, there have been more progress, and we spent more money than we planned. I mean, I find it really very interesting. So the focus has been on delivery, but that's been the, the actual action of building and everything else has been going on um, around all of that. So I, I'm, I'm interested in, in that aspect since we're in the, the, the DFAB group as well. And I think what I'd really like to start off with is, is with that as a background, um, what, will the, what will the new work culture look like? What should it look like? What should we be doing um, to uh, to make sure that the negative impacts of, uh, on gender and diversity um, can, can be replaced by, by good practices. So, Gudella, I don't know if, if I can ask you to start on that. You don't have to go into all of the construction bit, but really what, is, what must we do in the future to create um, a more equitable work culture for, for, for everybody? Um, my husband actually, the one I was drinking the margarita with last night, those who heard that, and um, he's actually, I mean, he's a structural engineer, has his own little office, and, and, and when I just saw him going through this, I was amazed that a lot of construction, nothing changed. As you said, everybody builds. Um, uh, also, the worries really about, I mean, is that risk groups, I mean, they, they just have to be, I mean, they're cramped into these cars and whatever in their little booth to have their their lunches and whatever so I was quite worried overall really about that aspect that somehow the worries seem to not really care and even the city in between I mean they announced to everyone to all the engineers to everybody uh, don't worry the pen uh, don't worry about the pandemic just keep building right I mean we we won't accept any delays and whatever I was quite quite uh, I thought that was quite scary. Uh, and I guess over this half year, um, it seems that there's a little bit happening in general around, I mean, providing more flexibility. And I would assume that, I mean, all the women then in that field um, hopefully will benefit from that. And, 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 and the, the family members of men working in construction in all sorts of ways might benefit. I mean, my husband, for instance, I think he was the first ever, I mean, 25 years ago, 20 years ago, who was allowed to work 80%. Um, uh, so, I mean, now people having seen and having an, one of one of my um, uh, uh, doctoral students, she's, she's um, with, with a structural engineer also, and in that company, they weren't even allowed to work from home in the spring, even. And they've learned now that hmm, maybe we should change that anyway, and, and there is more flexibility now. He actually gets to work 80% now too, so it seemed for construction specifically, mm -hmm. maybe this was a good thing, because people just really were forced to have this experience, that flexibility does not mean people don't do their jobs properly anymore. 
I'm just going to come in and make a quick comment on that. So, I mean, I'm I'm near, near retirement now, and I, I I've helped to build dams in Fiji with um, with the local Fijians, the Indian uh, um, um, citizens, and also expats. And it was an incredibly I was the only um, professional woman on the site, and it was incredibly difficult um, in the very conservative, very male environment. So. I think this is this is just to feed back a little bit, and we are way behind the practices in in, an, in a number of our other professions. It's improving, and you look at the number of civil engineering students that started off when I first came to ETH to about five percent, and now it's getting on to thirty percent. The world is changing, but it's still not quite where it is. Anyway, Gudella, sorry I interrupted you. Could you come on to the to the the, the new work culture? So that was fantastic. Your personal reflection about the about um, the industry. What must we be doing to create a more equitable future work culture? I I, I think so, simply to just build on this experience, but at the same time, this is what I said at the very start: to not always equate more flexibility with this is good for women. Um, and to automatically, I mean, assume that the women are the part-time workers, are the work people working from home more, etc. But it's really about everyone. Um, yeah, that's my hope. Thanks, Gudella. Who'd like to just come on straight after that? Who's the first one wants to say something to that? Okay. Well, I'm going to pick one of you, Christina. Would you like to come in now from the from the family side, um, perhaps, or whatever? Over to you. Yes, I, uh, I can't say anything on the construction uh, specifically, but in general, uh, family situation is extremely important. So we have to try to uh, have egalitarian partnerships because uh, we saw in uh, families having an egalitarian partnerships, uh, everything worked much better for, uh, for women. So uh, the burdens and the responsibilities uh, have to be shared uh, much more equally and um, this is something a family can do uh, in private but this is also something where we have to have a better let, uh, legislation for example so uh, we should have a, a parental leave with the same uh, time span for both fathers and for mothers and uh, we should also have uh, individual taxation for example um, I haven't still figured out what the employer can do, actually. Well, I, I think the employer can do things because we can go beyond legislation. So at the moment we offer, we offered before it was official legislation, 10 days of paternal leave. And we're now looking at whether we go up to 20, we split the four months so that the, the, the but then we have to be really careful when we're talking about fathers because they could be same gender couples. So again, I've fed that. Yeah into sure. our HR to say, please, will you make sure that is also um, covered, covered as well. And, um, and I think the employer can do things and can set examples and um, should be very open to that. So that was one of my uh, feedback to you. And, and of course, we'd be interested in what we need to be thinking about as well. But of course, every time you do something like that, it costs money. Um, are you know the universities are either funded by the canton or by the um, or by the state in our case, and so this is then taxpayers' money. So you have to be very careful how you go on um, with with taxpayers' money because that is a, a a huge issue. That's very interesting insight. Thank you so much, um, Christine. Patricia, can I come to you, please? Yeah, sure. Um, I agree with you, Sarah, that uh, there's also a certain responsibility on the corporate side, on the organizational side, you know, because I think it's important that they look closely. And on one hand, when we talk about work culture, I also would like to emphasize on the fact that there has to be a culture shift. Um, and, and in some companies, it's already taking place in terms of, you know, going away from that present culture um, uh, leading to a trust culture. So, um, and there I completely agree with what all of you have said, 
that we do not only have this notion that this is good for women, that they can work from, from home, because first of all, um, it's good for everyone, it's good for the whole society to have it more equal. And on the second uh, point, many, many women in, in our economy, they actually work in jobs that they cannot do from home at all. And usually uh, when people say a home office is good for women, they forget that more men work in jobs that can actually work from home, where women usually work in care work in hospitals you know um, cleaning like usually in in jobs that cannot be done from home and so i would be very careful with this notion of homework is good for women um, and then on the other hand um, i think the the leaders of the especially of the big corporates as well they really have to look very closely and individually and take their leadership role um, very seriously um, to not leave anyone behind and um, to make sure that this flexibility is actually not um, a burden again on the women, but really can um, strengthen uh, actually this, uh, this notion of, uh, of diversity inclusion as a performance in an innovation driver. Thanks very much, Patricia. Alexandra, would you like to? Comment. You're muted. There yes, you? of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, no. Normally, it shouldn't be very a big problem to really implement a new work culture. It's something about openness, uh, life phase oriented careers. So we have a lot of tools how we can implement it, but um, the organizations they don't have the need for the moment. Um, uh, I guess this is always a problem because we saw it uh, during the lockdown, there was a need for home office, suddenly it was not a problem to do home office. So um, this is always what I uh, really saw or observe in organizations, they do have a need. So if they have a need, for example, a lack of skilled workers, maybe then we have a change. Um, so we really have to do a lot of work how we convince them to to see there's really also their chances when we have a new new work culture that we have um, a better balance of life and work so um i guess this is the big issue because the tools we have really we, we have to change the mind uh, the um the mind or the uh, yes, the mindset of, of uh, organizations. And um, also it's a, a societal, a societal uh, on the societal level we have to work because we have it also in our mind, a lot of uh, people uh, that women uh, work on part-times and the men's male uh, employees really work full-time. And there has to be change that also male employees can work part-time and women of course full-time and so I guess it has to be become more normal to us that everything is allowed and everything is really accepted by by society and also by the employer um, and what we saw in our in our study was that the home office for example it was for those women a problem who really worked part-time the woman who worked full time had no problem with organizing all the stuff uh, of, of home office. So, and this is also a, an issue where we see there has to be a lot of work um, that um, for part time pe uh, workers, it's also not a problem to have to do home office. Um, so, yeah, there are a lot of, um, I, I guess, always a lot of thinking a lot of reflection, what we really um, want to have or what type of culture we like to have in our organization. And this reflection has to be done. And for the moment, there was no reflection. We're just looking, what are the others doing? What uh, does the market say? And um, so we are oriented by these topics, but not on our reflection, what is important to our organization. And that, that's coming back to doing the right things, actually, yeah. um, as opposed to just sort of doing things right in the sort of way you think it is. So doing the right things comes out of that. Nora, what, what's your take on this, please? Well, I think there's there are two things that come to my mind. Um, 
one, um, just to continue on what Alexandra was saying, I mean, these changes with regard to home office and remote work were implemented so quickly that I think very few organizations were really ready. And one thing that I've observed is that this has really increased expectations about availability. So I think mm -hmm. rather than giving people more flexibility and how to balance their other responsibilities with work, it's now this idea that you're available all the time and that doesn't actually increase flexibility. So I think, especially for those companies who weren't ready for this change, what really has to happen when we go back to a more hybrid model is to sit back and think, well, yes, what worked and what really didn't work. So not just to assume that this has just been a good thing. That's a, a fantastic recommendation. I, I find it interestingly um, in my current role as, as rector, the intensity just keeps on going. And, you know, you end up by working typically seven days a week and late into the evening because of all of the meetings and things. And where do you prepare for the, for the meetings? It's really, I mean, I have a couple of, I found that really insightful. And I have a couple of comments about that. I think thinking in an academic world where we're working very hard to attract um, women professors, outstanding women professors, um, who quite often have dual career um, needs. And I look at our young assistant professors today at ETH and they, the partnerships seem to be much more egalitarian. And I think some of this is about the times we're living in and some of it is about education and some of it is about employer responsibility, making it very clear that this is important. So, I mean, I was the ninth professor and, and you now our first rector, Heidi, didn't have any kids. I don't have any kids. Um, quite a few of those in that top 10 group didn't have any, didn't have any kids because it was just extremely tough to get up there with, with families as well. We're trying to change that. And one of the goals of, uh, of, of our culture change, our rethink process that Goodella is involved in, is to say that it should be about quality and not about quantity. So when you're doing something, do it really well uh, and don't just chunk out just to get more and more and more and more. And I think this is a very important message. And I think when you're employing people, you need to look at that and say, it's about quality. It's about the personality and the way in which you, 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 you perform and behave rather than I'm going to tick this lot, this, this, this lot off. And I'm delighted to say that our president is a setting a great example because he said, I'm going to work one day at home. This is really important to emphasize again, the family friendly nature of things. And I think Coming on to another side now, um, having worked in a very male industry, there was a hell of a lot about what was done at the pub and in the gents' loo and all the rest of it. And there was a, a huge amount of sim, subliminal chauvinism in terms of being there in the network, being in the group. And, 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 and so my question at that stage was always about, well, the, where are the decisions made? Are they made in the boardroom? Are they made at work? or they made quietly in these little, in these little clubs and who has the influence. So, so making the decision is one thing, but you have to have influence. So one of the things I've always tried to set myself up to do was to be able to create win-win partnerships, to be able to influence the outcome of the decision and being part of that decision-making um, decision um, group. So I think that would be my input to this little, um, to this little round, and I know I'm meant to be chairing the discussion. I'm not supposed to be saying too many things, but there we go. I'm, I'm Caitlin, and I have decided we're having a short pause, or Caitlin has told me we're having a pause, just for the panelists who are already back. Just, um, just a warning. Um, I'm going to ask questions then about the positive change. So the, we talked a little bit about the new work culture. Uh, and I think we've sort of covered a little bit the impact of new work and we can pick that up on the questions afterwards. But then there was very much interest about what can leaders do to make a positive change and what can individuals do. So I think my um, next bit will be to each of you, uh, what can leaders do and what can individuals do? Just a little reflection on that. And then I think we should throw the floor open to, um, to the participants to ask questions directly. So we'll do a, a short 
around on that, because I think this is really interesting to see how the different um, experiences and the different people have come up with common themes, but all sorts of very interesting um, details and ideas and variations. So um, that's what I'd like to do when Caitlin tells us we can we can go again. Great. Yep. I'm just going to close the poll now and share the results. Okay. So it seems m most people were satisfied, a good portion of people were dissatisfied. Mm -hmm. um, sorry to see the people who were completely dissatisfied, that's very frustrating. And uh, most, feel, most people have their feeling of empowerment has remained about the same. Some increase, some decrease. Yeah. Pretty even spread there. Yeah. So okay. two thirds really from somewhat satisfied upwards, which is in, in, encouraging. I think we're very lucky to live in this country, I have to say, in lots yeah. of ways. If you were asking this question in some other countries in the world, I think um, we would have a completely different uh, picture. And we mustn't forget that, actually, because in all of the criticisms of everything, um, relatively, we're doing, we have a lot of positives. Great. Okay, so I'm now going to um, come to um, the question about what can leaders do to um, make a positive change and, and likewise, what can the individuals do? And I think in the world today, we're seeing the power of individual action much more. There are many more tools that are um, at, our, um, at, at our service. Patricia, would you like to start on this one, please? Yeah, sure, thanks. Um... I do think that there's a huge responsibility that lies on our leaders. Um, I think, as you already mentioned, they have to look very closely and to each individual and um, see what they can actually change or empower individually um, in terms of uh, also, you know, being more strong in this uh, in this crisis. And then the second one where I would like to emphasize on is the promotion practice. I still feel even before the crisis, um, a lot of the promotions were not handled equally. I mean, we still have this notion that men get um, uh, promoted uh, based on their potential and women uh, based on their performance. And um, I think with the crisis, and with the, uh, the the duties on women and maybe staying home, taking care of children more than men, I have a little bit the fear that that could, um, you know, be pronounced even more so, and that the notion gets even um, a little bit uh, stronger. So I would ask um, for our leaders to evaluate the promotion practices even further and implement very standardized uh, criteria for both men and women uh, and for both part-time and full-time uh, employees. And I hope that would then help so that we actually do not have then a backlash in the long term, you know, out of this crisis in terms of uh, gender equality on the top. And what can individuals do, Patricia? That's very good advice. Promotion practice is essential. Um, individuals, what can individuals do? Well, on the on the um, individual side, I think it depends a little bit in which um, role you are, right? Um, I would say if you're a woman, I also strongly empower women to um, require uh, a, a certain sort of responsibility for themselves. You know, um, they have to approach their problems as well as well, and really do not. Um, you know, face the, the the challenge that they're being holding back, you know, so that they really use the opportunity also at home for a partnership based the division of labor, but then also on a professional level to really express their interest in being promoted. And um, even if the notion is that the part-time employee and a mother, uh, because we do have the motherhood bias there as well, uh, does not want to be promoted, especially in a crisis. So I think um, as a woman, you also have a certain responsibility. And as a man, again, there, um, it's always funny to hear when we uh, hear men saying, I support my wife. And I'm like, well, it's not a support, right? It's like, uh, you're the father of your children as well. This is not just some sort of hobbies. The same goes when men are asked, what are your hobbies? And they say, my kids. I'm like, your kids are not your hobbies, right? Um, so that's uh, something where I feel there as a man, you can also maybe just be a little bit more aware, aware of how you phrase things. 
Thank you for that great advice, Patricia. Alexandra, how about coming to you, please? Yes, um, I guess the role of leadership really will change. And this is the most big problem for leaders. They have to accept that their role will change in future. So I guess that's the first point. They have really to accept uh, that there's now a difference. Um, then they have to trust uh, their employees. That's the most important issue to really uh, trust the employees. They have to also to be a good example how we can... Um, combine good family and, uh, and uh, work, how to do a home office, how to organize a team. So they have to be a good example uh, to, to employees. Um, and of course, they have more organizational work now because they have to organize the communication. When we have a virtual team, they have to organize a little bit more the communication and um, to find another way to lead. So the lead, uh, leadership style will be more individual uh, than before. And um, yes, I think that's for the first time the most important topics to me, um, how, how leadership will, uh, will be in future. This is very frightening for those of us who are leading. Somebody needs <laughs> help. So but seriously, this means actually that there is a need for helping people yeah. To, make that, to make that transition and so that people who are in this business are going yeah. to be quite, quite busy and the leaders have to say, I need help. And that's also very important, the self-awareness. Um, Gudela, could you give us your views on this, please? I agree with everything that has, said or has been said already and very well so. Maybe one additional point, something super basic, but which I think overall is lacking a lot, is how to deal with feedback. And that goes also to Sarah. I mean, you're saying you need to ask for support. There's generally kind of asking for resources and giving resources and making this a very normal, very informal process. And, and that currently, for instance, is particularly difficult. So questions how can we do this even when everything is this sort of super efficient zoom dong 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 all day long but i think this is also a much more general thing i mean that then even goes into promotion practices performance management practices mm -hmm. um so to, ha to to have a focus really on this i mean to to just more easily go back and forth on on on, on learning from each other and 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 seeking advice seeking support and giving, obviously, also then advice and support. And resources are, are, are not only money, they're also time, actually, which is really very valuable. Any thoughts on the individual, how an individual can create positive change? I think that's basically the same thing, right? Uh, I mean, we need to, as, as Patricia was saying, I mean, we need to voice our concerns. We need to voice our expectations. Our, On the other hand, also our willingness to fulfill expectations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, to, to, to start that hopefully more fluid dialogue or whatever you want to call it. And clearly, I think that was said, I mean, that goes along with that also that for a long time now, I mean, leadership research has promoted a more individualized approach to things. So you don't have kind of the one style that fits mm -hmm. everywhere and for everyone. Mm -hmm. And this is more pronounced again now. And I guess it will be in the future. And therefore, this feedback, seeking, giving, whatever, that, that's a good basis also just to learn about what, what are the individual needs and expectations. Thank you for that. I think, I think leadership style is really an interesting one because if you're a, a really good leader you, can, leader, you can flex yourself to the style that's necessary for the context that you're in. And that's the biggest challenge because we all have certain preferences where we're good and we know, you know, when Sarah is good, this is what she does well. When Sarah is bad, this is what, so how do you make the bad more, turn it more into good so that you're consistently doing the right thing on a, on a regular, and this is the, 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 the challenge that I face on a, daily, on a daily basis I can share uh, with you. Nora, would you like to give us your views on, uh, on, on that, please? Sure, I think one of the key ways to lead in this kind of environment is to live by the maxim to check in on people rather than to check up on people. Um, I think a lot of ways in which leaders 
would usually keep track of how their employees are doing and what they're doing it was really informal. Like you would pass someone, you'd see how they're feeling. And I think one key challenge then is how do you make sure that you can keep that going? And I think if you don't have a set way to do that with every single employee, the feeling is going to be that you're checking up on what they're doing, that you're not really trusting them. So I think taking the time to really individually talk to every direct report and ask, well, what do you need from me in terms of communication? Like whether that is, you know, let's have a set time each week, like a little window where we talk, um, or whether that person might prefer to just contact me or you when they need something to really make sure that it is clear what that person prefers. I think that can be a really good way to do that. Um, I think conversely, employees then also have a responsibility to, to be really honest about what they need. So don't just say, oh, no, 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 I'll just come to you when I need something because they think that that's what the leader wants to hear. I think in this environment, in this situation, being honest about what works is actually really crucial. So I think, yeah, checking in, not checking up. Thank you very much, Nora, wonderful. Um, and Christina, I'll come to you to close down this little group on positive change, please. Yes, I think in order to create changes here, we uh, must probably start at uh, several levels simultaneously. So on the one hand, employees themselves must be sensitized to the situation and learn, to, learn good examples from uh, other companies. So they themselves must develop an idea of what possibilities exist and what advantages they have with new forms of work and new forms of leadership. And uh, second is um, the training of the HR also seems very important to me. So especially in technical companies, I experience HR as rather conservative and not uh, very aware of gender equality issues. And uh, HR is often the first point of contact for employees. So they should be better informed about new forms of work, new forms of management and uh, about gender equality, of course. And uh, third level uh, would then be the leadership level. And uh, well, I'm not an expert here, but uh, I think leaders would have to be made like uh, curious about new forms of leadership or new forms of work so that they really want to learn more about them. So we should probably not impose new ideas on them, but make them want to know more about it. So more like an intrinsic motivation. Uh, but how exactly to do this, uh, I still have to figure out. Okay, and individual? Well, individual would be uh, to just be um, aware of all the possibilities and be aware of the needs you have. And for this, you might have uh, to have discussions like we have in this webinar. You just have to realize what is my situation and do I have to, uh, am I comfortable with this situation? Do I want to stay in this situation? What are other people doing? What are other companies doing? Would this also be a situation for me? But often in daily business, we are so, um, we have no time to think about this. So we really need kind of a breakout room to, to uh, reflect on new possibilities of uh, how to work, how to have a family, how to combine everything. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much. I've, I've asked Caitlin whether I can just show one slide which um, I have in the past uh, showed actually at something that the University of Zurich was hosting. And I just want to um, really pick up on the fact if I can work out how the heck I can shut this down. Uh, no, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to show that slide. Um, hang on, I've got myself now in a, in a, in a tizwas of um, putting my screens in all the wrong place. So I can't actually show it. Here we go, I'm getting on top of it. There we go, right, I want to show you this slide. I want to show you this slide. Um, is it coming up? Okay, because um, I wanted to talk about political leaders and I wanted to talk about the fact that the women who uh, you probably don't, you might know the names of them. And if we were to rate them during the corona pandemic, okay, I had a couple of other examples here, which I didn't design for this. Um, but I wanted to just show you um, 
and, and, and the, the women on the top have performed in the most outstanding way in the corona pandemic where i was uh, where i would say these chaps here on the bottom left absolutely have not um have not performed at all and there's been quite a lot of chat about what makes a good women a women leader really be able to perform and i think there's a combination of courage compassion commitment and a little bit of wisdom and you'd be pleased to hear people who listen to the uh, to the good science. So I think for me, that was something that was important um, in in understanding uh, what is um, what's the best thing, what's the best thing to do. So I'm not saying that you should only be a woman to lead, but certainly those women leaders got it right. Uh, and a lot of the male leaders, I don't think um, I don't think uh, did, at least those who are running countries. Right, so on that note, um, I would like to uh, suggest that if anybody would like to pop a few questions into the chat, then we will um, try and answer those. And I'd like to ask um, who is going to read out the questions and answers, or, or will I do that, Caitlin, will I choose them, or will Nora, or will, will you, Caitlin? Uh, I will, because um, I've gotten one question so far and it was sent to me privately. Okay, um, go on then. Good. One question to you, Sarah. Is there a planned debriefing method promoted at ETH to discuss the lessons learned when we do return to an at-work situation or a hybrid model? And how will feedback be collected to inform and affect the school policy? Okay, so I think we're constantly reviewing things. And certainly I'm now going to go into my, my area, which is teaching. And um, we are uh, collecting information and ideas already. And I, I, my hope is that the middle of next year, we might be able to go to Monte Verita um, with the directors of studies, the students, the assistants, the uh, teaching um, specialists, and the coordinators, all of the people who have something to do with teaching, so that we can go and, um, and share ideas. And we'll have to plan it carefully so that we can suck in all the ideas and then process what are the right things to do. Um, and I think that's happening at a school level. Um, I'm sure that will happen at a school level uh, as, as well. We've opened up all sorts of different ways of communicating with people. So these town halls that we've been doing, I never did a town hall um, before Corona. And I think these are very valuable and the inputs that come in there are taken away and are uh, looked at and I'm quite sure there will be a formal consultation at, uh, at some stage so don't worry um, we're really listening and what I would say in my sort of closing statement to this is you will be aware probably those who are inside ETH we have this sort of culture change program called Rethink R E T H Inc and within our institution this has got threads of changing the leadership we now have two female vice presidents so when you add in Katerina Poiger actually the executive board is four plus four this is stunning I never thought this would happen at ETH um, there's what is a professorship in the future because it's completely impossible what a professor is expected to be how does a, how do you help to lead uh, as a professor, um, what happens in the departments, what happens in the central organs, as they call it, um, the central administration, and, and then what's the culture? And, and what do we have to change in ter terms of the culture of the organization? Gudella is the leader of, of that, um, co-leader of that, together with Joel Mezzo and, and me. And this is a, about having conversations uh, within various groups, across various groups, so that we can learn for that and try and get bottom up input to what we want to do together um, in the future. So that's how ETH is going to, um, going to try and consult um, and listen and act. Gudella can say something about it as well, actually. If she... Still don't see any other questions. No, I'm fine. I think you said it all very well. <laughs> Any more questions? I, I guess want to jump in with a question then, and maybe um, once I've done that, other people will open up a bit. Um, a couple of sessions ago, we had a specific, uh, we'd asked people to share their stories about lockdown. And we had one particular story that was a little bit 
heartbreaking and a bit frustrating. And I would like to ask the panel what this person could do to um, improve their situation. So the story was that this person has a very small child and during the lockdown have lost childcare as lots of people had and have been told by their employer to not worry about their hours, it would all be worked out later. So this person had continued to look after her child and had tried to catch up, tried to do as much work as she possibly could, but obviously that was reduced significantly. After the lockdown finished, this person was then told by her boss, don't worry, you've got until next year to rework up the, over, the under hours to turn your hours to zero. So she has a year effectively to work two months of extra work. This is just not feasible. And obviously she was quite upset about this. Um, what as a person with relatively little power as an employee, can you do if you are put in a situation like this to improve, um, what can you do to empower yourself and to show your boss that what they are doing has not been acceptable. Who would like to answer that tricky conundrum? Very sad story. Anybody got any clever advice, insights? Okay, everybody's being a bit quiet. Well, my feedback to that would be, um, it sounds like the boss is, and I can't say it because I'm being recorded. Um, uh, I shan't say what I think. Um, I would go and find somebody who can uh, who can help me to talk to the boss at Augenhoe, as it were, the eye level. So, um, and some of it is about educating the boss, and um, some of it is about actually uh, saying to him that it's completely unacceptable what he's doing. There are probably a number of other people in his organisation as as well. So. It's difficult without knowing the context as to whether or not there are lots of people can bring the skills that this employee can can bring. But if this is the way they're going about it, they're going to reduce the diversity of their organization. They should look down the road and say, this is what the impact on your organization could well be. And who's going to want to come and work for a, an, an employer who behaves like this? But maybe I'm idealistic. I've been out of commercial practice for um, many years working for a university but it really is, in my view, not acceptable. Christina, would you like to add something to that? Much more intelligent than mine, I'm quite sure. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, it's another way uh, to, to, to solve this problem. Or um, I would go to your boss with a good solutions. Uh, don't let your boss think of solutions for him or herself, but come up with the solutions yourself. And to have good solutions, you have to collect examples uh, on how other companies solved such situations. So uh, this person should inform herself um, uh, how did other companies cope with this situation and then uh, work out a good solution, go to her boss and say, look, um, other companies, um, mothers, fathers could stay at home all the time that worked as well. So um, why can't we do this as well? Thank you very much, Christina. So we're getting lots of questions coming in now. There's a very mm -hmm. interesting one that is related very much to a university environment. Um, giving advice to women leaders working day and night in the associations for the development of scientific staff and they're working on a voluntary basis. So I guess they're doing their normal jobs at the same time. In the lockdown, the workload has increased multiple times. There is no lack of motivation, but sometimes it's difficult to focus on personal development because the issues need urgent attention. Um, that sounds good, Ella. It sounds like that might be directed um, something that you might be able to have a go at. Would you like to give a an answer? And if anybody else would like to double up on that. So what I'll probably do is take two goes to answer the questions because we're beginning to get quite a lot of questions in now, which is great. Well, probably in a way that is almost like a little bit like the question before in a way, because I mean, if you if you do your day work or whenever you do it actually, and then you do these extra things and the university in this case actually wants you to do these extra things because they're part of, of, of the glue of the organization, 
then, I mean, even in normal times, hopefully there would be a bit of time allowance for that, that is not completely uh, night work and weekend work and, and even more so now. And I guess, I mean, I'm a, some of the, the, the comments we got in the survey over, over the spring were actually kind of a bit critical towards the ETH in terms of, or in, in general towards, towards leadership to anywhere in the ETH that we were so proud that we kept up efficiency and effectiveness and some people kept saying well don't do that i mean really allow for us to to maybe not be as effective and don't expect that of us because uh, we just can't right um and this is kind of a, a similar thing to me i mean how much do we do we recognize kind of basic organization citizenship behavior which is always the extra bit um and, and, and to leave space for that and to leave space for this even more now because we need that glue more than ever now. But that's again, just hoping for good employ, employer behavior, I guess. Any, anybody else like to add anything to that? Happy with that? Okay, don't see anybody in that case, I'll move on to the next question. Um, do you think that the pandemic has increased or not the sense of individuality autonomy in how we approach work life and how assertive to be. Who'd like to ask? Alexandra, do you fancy having a go at that one? Uh, yes. Um, I guess, yeah, there is maybe a more sense of individuality, but uh, there's also more sense of communication, communication in teams. So really to find rules or to set up rules in the team. And another point is also that uh, employees are more sensitive to really stand up for for their needs what they need what they like to have uh, for workplace how um, and so I guess there's a change that we really we know now uh, dif a different way of working and now we are really stand up for this way and um, fix it up and uh, discuss it also in in our teams thank you I suppose in a sense you know the question is almost, well, why wouldn't we, if it's going to work, it, it's got a very good chance of working better. Nora, Patricia, any comments on Yeah, that? but um, what, what I would like to add is, I, I, I think we have to be careful here just to see it too positively, right? Because I think um, um, at the same time, um, the, what I said in the beginning with setting boundaries and having self-discipline and so on, uh, we also heard um, feedbacks from companies where the rate of burnouts actually increased since March. And, and that's another thing, you know, um, and, and it, it goes also in the same direction of telling um, people, um, I mean, they, they let us know that they feel actually lonely at the end of the day. You know, those ho this whole notion of individualism um, actually can also lead to a challenge of feeling too lonely and not belonging actually to a team. And, and what Nora said before, you know, this, this checking in and, and then also setting up regular, I don't know, coffee chats or uh, virtual happy hours or just something, you know, to kind of... Um, go into the direction of meeting um, in, in, the, in the coffee kitchen, usually when you are at work. And I just also feel that we have to take into consideration the employee's individual situation, you know, single moms, um, uh, living alone, um, not having a family around and so on. I think we have to be very careful that we don't let anyone behind. So I would really also uh, want to stress the fact that um, individualism um, can also lead to a fact of, of loneliness. Nora? I, th I think one thing I would like to stress here is also that it's okay to just do okay, just doing your work. Maybe this isn't a year for amazing amounts of growth or amazing amounts of progress. And in part, I think, because this year is also real strain on a lot of people's mental health. Um, whether it be loneliness or increased stress or uncertainty or fear. And so I think it's also really important also as a leader to normalize just doing your best and just doing okay is fine too. It doesn't have to be this amazing year of progress either. And I think to make that clear to employees is also really important. I think that's wonderful advice that rather link, links in also to 
um, what you've all just said to the question from Miriam about own choice, where to work and building teamwork. Again, I think that's very dependent upon where you are and what your situation is. Um, and I think that's about communication and discussion. One of the things I think is really important is that when you have a, an appraisal with your, your boss, that you go into that and you're at the same level as it were, and you're able to talk about a lot of different things in that framework than you wouldn't talk about on a, on a daily or a weekly or a monthly basis. And I think creating that way in which you can say things there and get feedback and, and have it effectively recorded is, is an important part about that relationship. But that, that's my personal view. I always learned a lot from um, the, the annual appraisals I did with my, um, my, my team. And I think one of the other things, picking up on what Nora just said, you know, what are the basics? Well, um, we, need to, we need to breathe, we need to sleep, we need to eat, and we need to move. And I think that um, all of those are, are very important parts and we need to see people. And they're very important parts of, um, of how we act as, 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 human, as human beings. And um, I think, again, talking about opportunities as an individual to make a, a difference. Um, I think it's really important that you are kind, that you look to the left and the right and you see, try to see if people are suffering, if you haven't heard from people for a while. Um, how many times have we gone through our address book and thought about the, the ancient aunt who's sitting at home completely on her own or um, other people who've been important to you in the past? Have you turned around and given them a call just to listen to what they're saying? What about people you work with? All of those things. I think we need to be more imaginative about um, how we reach out to, um, to, other, to, other, to other people. Um, and I think we need, to, we need to move things. So talking about an individual, okay, I'm a rector of a university and I have a certain amount of, uh, of, of power, but at some stage, and I'm not sure quite why they're taking so long, we will have an initiative that will be called ETH Move. Um, I've also wanted to get um, the other universities involved in this as well. And it's all about moving, getting people to go out there to move. I went to, up into the woods yesterday and went skipping uh, and took some, had some videos taken of that just to try and stimulate people to reach out and, and share and move and do things with, with other people because I think you can do that. And with the social networks we have these days, there is a, a lot you can reach. We have the DFAB, this DFAB network, um, and I'm quite sure there is a lot that individuals can do if there are some really um, very good ideas. So on, on that note, um, um, Caitlin, are you going to um, say something a little bit now about as we come towards the end? I think we had a summary um, from uh, Nora, who was going mm -hmm. to record the words of wisdom of everybody and Caitlin will close off with a final poll. I think that's, uh, I think yes. that's it. Yes. Exactly. We, we do have one more question about getting men involved. If anyone has a, a quick answer for how to bring men into this conversation, it's, a, it's the eternal question in equality issues. Um, but if anyone, yeah, Christina? Um, this is an important question, really. And um, I think we should see this in uh, two steps. Um, and to my opinion, first, women have to discuss those um, topics among women only, just to realize what it is that makes such situations so difficult. So they just have to find words for their feelings and their experiences. And they have to um, discuss uh, such topics such as mental load, for example, or emotional care work which uh, today mostly only women uh, or mothers um, experience, they have to discuss this uh, on their own. And then in the second step, or maybe it could also be kind of simultaneously, of course, men should be brought in, but just, uh, but to my opinion, not from the beginning. I would have to say my experience uh, agrees with that. Thank you. Good. So as Sarah said, um, first of all, thank you all very much for your inputs. Um, Nora has taken some notes and uh, she might have some highlights to share with us to wrap up everything. Yes, thank you, Caitlin. Um, 
well, it's always difficult to uh, condense wise words. Um, I think everyone knows that. Um, and um, well, I'll try my best. Let's start with um, the first um, question about the best, the most challenging, um, the lesson learned from, from lockdown and the whole situation. And um, things that were like very present um, was the word or the concept of flexibility. Um, and that, uh, that were both a good thing and a bad thing, um, especially in bad, uh, in a sense, um, as it um, conflicted or as it imposed availability. Um, and that is a strain on many people, like the sense of constant availability um, and that this doesn't create flexibility at all um, and that we have to rethink that. Um, and the idea to like personally and also in, in with colleagues, the need to set boundaries on one hand, but also the need to take a stand and to take on responsibility for oneself and um, for one's needs, um, for the resources. Um, and how to, to, to put them to good use and how to get more uh, from your employer, um, but also from, yeah, from your partner, uh, friends and so on. Um, good things, um, best things, um, to see the kids more. I think that, that cannot be um, mentioned um, often enough to be more around the family. That was a good thing that was mentioned. And uh, I think, um, if you were able to get that and to get more compassion, to get the feeling that the social network works is also something that some people enjoyed and, and had the experiences of, experience of, and that was really um, uh, that thing that um, helped us through the crisis, if you had that experience. And I think quite a few people had that. Um, now to the more um, topical question in the sense of um, construction at the field of construction and how do we um, how can we uh, work towards creating a more gender equal more equal uh, work culture um, again the word flexibility pops up but not uh, as a general concept but very um, you have to to be careful how you define flexibility and how flexibility is used in a sense so it isn't that isn't uh, um, that the boss that to be to be very uh, well um, to frame it like simply um, that the boss can um, require utmost utmost flexibility and that you are then by that constantly available um, but that uh, flexibility goes both ways um, and that you have that you're more flexible in the way you can breathe sleep eat move and meet people I think that's very central. Um, not to forget that you're a human being um, and that it's essential. Um, well, um, something um, that's also very present is that you cannot solve a problem on your own, but you yourself as an individual also need to take on responsibility um, to affect affect change, to affect um, um, the, the change of the mindset um, that seems to be quite present still, especially in the construction um, business, um, that, that uh, for example, men work full-time, building has to go on, um, there should be no delays, uh, we need productivity, and we, not, we need results, and we need it now. And um, that we all need to work on that, also on an individual level. And um, yeah, the change is possible. We saw that to like towards home office, uh, more flexible working hours. Um, I don't. I think it was uh, Alexandra Close who said that they only do it if they have to. Um, so we need to 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 make them see um, that the must is uh, also something that doesn't necessarily have to come from rules set by a pandemic. So that's also about mental, the change of the mindset. Um, but that's really tricky. And obviously that needs a lot more work. Um, something else, um, like in terms of how do, we, how do we change how decisions are made and by whom and in which context? Is it in, in, in the pub uh, with the men uh, or in the golf club where women have no access to? Uh, even in the strip club, I don't know. 
I guess that used to be the case at some point. I'm sorry. Um, so um, leadership, the question of leadership. And uh, again, I quote Sarah on that, compassion, courage, commitment, and trust in science. And of course, that's, um, um, the trust in science is directly related to the corona pandemic. Um, but it is also, you can say it also applies trust in science. Um, there's a lot of research into work culture and a lot of research into leadership culture. And companies should trust or begin to trust that science and begin to actually look left and right and, and look towards good examples and what works. And uh, I don't think that happens uh, enough at the moment. And it should, there should start to be a, like a, a change towards that. Yeah, I, I hope I, um, oh, and one more thing that especially um, um, resounded with me was the, the idea that leaders or the, the, the need for leaders not to uh, check up on people, uh, especially at this uh, in this situation, but to check in and show trust uh, to their employees. I think that's essential, especially when we talk about communication and making people feel um, as members of a team uh, that are valued and that you trust and that can, can communi communicate with each other on a on an eye to eye level.